Well, hello there once again. It's Mr. Johnson coming to you here from Westlake High School, Classroom 408, here in Johnson Land. I am going to share with you a uh, simple little short story by Kate Chopin called The Story of an Hour. It's a pretty simple story, this one and uh, the one we're reading tomorrow in class, the next day after you, <clears throat> we covered this one in class, uh, Desiree's Baby. These stories by Kate Chopin don't really require having a nerdy, bald uh, loser of an English teacher read them to you and discuss them with you because they're pretty easy to understand what's going on if you were to read them. But uh, whereas we're in this last nine weeks, it's less number of grades, every grade kind of matters some. When we do take a test on these two stories, I would like to have at least made the attempt to read them kind of to you and just kind of discuss them, make sure you know exactly what's going on. So you can maybe smoke that test that we take on these stories. Uh, they're both pretty short and easy to understand. This one is, is really short. It's called The Story of an Hour, and it's uh, set in 1894. It's a story about a woman called Mrs. Mallard. Her name is Louise, Louise Mallard, and her husband, Brentley Mallard. Also in the story, uh, her sister Josephine is in the story, and uh, her husband's friend Richards is in the story. Uh, this is an older couple. It's an old lady and an old man, and it starts off with this uh, this terrible tragedy that happens to the husband. Let's read this. It's called The Story of an Hour by Kate Chopin. Knowing that Mrs. Mallard was afflicted with heart trouble, great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. Her husband had died tragically. She already has a heart issue, so they're very careful to inform her as gently as possible that her husband passed. It was her sister Josephine who told her in broken sentences failed hints that revealed in half concealing. Her husband's friend, Richards, was there too, near her. It was he who had been in the newspaper office when intelligence of the railroad disaster was received, with Brentley Mallard's name leading the list of killed. He had only taken time to assure himself of its truth by a second telegram and had uh, hastened to forestall any less careful, less tender friend in bearing the sad message. Uh, Brentley, uh, had died in this terrible uh, train crash, uh, <clears throat> railroad disaster, you know, train crash. And uh, his friend Richards had been in the newspaper office when, when word got through and his name, his friend's name, uh, Brantley Mallard, was on uh, the killed list. And uh, he verified it for sure before he came to the house, but he's, he's here with the news for uh, Louise, for Mrs. Mallard, that her husband has died in a train crash. She did not hear the story, as many women would have heard the same, with a paralyzed inability to accept its significance. She wept at once with sudden, wild abandonment in her sister's arms. With a storm of grief had spent itself into, uh, when the storm of grief had spent itself, she went away to her room alone. She would have no one follow her. When she got the news, she just immediately wept full force in her sister's arms, uh, just grief-stricken, and then leaves and goes to the next room just to be by herself. There stood, facing the open window, a comfortable, roomy armchair. Into this she sank, pressed down by a physical exhaustion that haunted her body and seemed to reach into her soul. She could see in the open square before her house the tops of trees that were all a-quiver with the new spring life. Delicious breath of rain was in the air. In the street below, a peddler was crying his wares. The notes of a distant song, which someone was singing, reached her faintly, and countless sparrows were twittering in the eaves. So Mrs. Mallard goes into the next room. Uh, her sister and her husband's friend are, are still in the house, and she sits in this armchair looking out into uh, the street, looking out this window, and she hears these sounds, and it's, it's kind of a beautiful day, and there's birds tweeting, and there's people selling their stuff on the streets, and, and she just uh, gets a different feel here than she had just had in her, her moments of grief a while ago. There were patches of blue sky showing here, and there through the clouds there had met a, uh, and piled one above the other in the west facing her window. She sat with her head thrown back upon the cushion of the chair, quite motionless, except when a sob came up and took her throat into her throat and shook her, as a child who has cried itself to sleep continues to sob in its dreams. She was young with fair, calm face, whose lines bespoke repression and even a certain strength. But now there was a dull stare in her eyes, whose gaze was fixed away off yonder on those patches of blue sky. It was not a glance of reflection, but rather indicated a suspension 
of intelligent thought. There was something coming to her. She was waiting for it, fearfully. What was it? She did not know. It was too subtle and elusive to name. But she felt it, creeping out of the sky, reaching toward her through the sounds, the scents, the colors that filled the air. Now her bosom rose and fell tumultuously. She was beginning to recognize this thing that was approaching to possess her. And she was, uh, and she was striving to beat it back with her will, as powerless as the two white slender hands would have been. When she abandoned herself a little, whispered, uh, when she bent herself, a little whispered word escaped her slightly parted lips. She said it over and over under the breath. Free. 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 The vacant stare and the look of terror that followed it went from her eyes. They stayed keen and bright. Her pulses beat fast and coursing blood warmed and relaxed every inch of her body. So Mrs. Mallory had gone into this room. She sits in this chair. She looks out this window and she's grieving. But then she has this this feeling creep upon her. She's not sure what it is at first, and she realizes uh, that she's free. Her husband's passed away, and she should feel terrible and be grieving, but now she's just overcome with a sense of freedom, freedom from that marriage. And obviously she feels guilty for feeling that way. She did not stop to ask if it were or were not a monstrous joy that held her. A clear and exalted perception enabled her to dismiss the suggestion as trivial, she knew that she would weep again when she saw that kind, tender hands folded in death, the face that had never looked save with love upon her, fixed and gray and dead. But she saw beyond that bitter moment a long procession of years to come that would belong to her absolutely. And she opened and spread her arms out to them in welcome. So she's sitting in this chair, and she knows that she will uh, grieve her husband. She knows that the, at the funeral, with this body there in the casket, she will grieve and she will she will go through all of the, the <clears throat> normal things that people do as they comfort her and, and that uh, uh, things like that in, in, in the loss of her husband. But also all she can think about right now is, is every day going forward from this moment belongs to her absolutely. It's not a moment that she has to share with her husband in any way, shape, or form. There would be no one to live for during those coming years. She would live for herself. There would be no powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence with which men and women believe they have, they have the right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. Kind intention or cruel intention made the act seem no less a crime as she looked upon it in that brief moment of illumination. She comes to the full realization here that, uh, you know, when you're married, especially if you've been married a long time, you always uh, kind of have to compromise. You have to bend to each other's will. You impose your will upon the other. And all of those years of experience of, of, of having his will imposed upon her or her having to work to impose her will upon him, all of that will imposing, you know, fighting to get your way, getting what you want and whatnot, all of that's gone. There is no more Brantley. There is no more husband. Every moment of her life now is hers. And yet she had loved him sometimes. Often she had not. What did it matter? What could love the unsolved mystery count for in the face of uh, this possession of self-assertion, which she suddenly recognized as the strongest impulse of her being. If you're marking anything in the story, and there's not really a lot to mark, you can be annotating as you, as you wish on things that might seem important. But if I were you, I would highlight or underline the words, the unsolved mystery, in that paragraph we just read, the unsolved mystery. And that's just a reference to marriage. Marriage itself in this story is the unsolved mystery. Nobody can really figure out how to you know, make it work and whatnot in, in, in a love relationship like this. The unsolved mystery, marriage. Free, body and soul free, she kept whispering. Josephine was kneeling before the closed door with her lips to the keyhole, imploring for admission. Louise, open the door, I beg. Open the door, you will make yourself ill. What are you doing, Louise? For heaven's sake, open the door. Her sister's right outside the door and had seen how heavily she weeped when she got the news. So she's concerned about her. She thinks she's in there grieving, which she's really in there kind of celebrating her freedom. Go away. I'm not making myself ill. <clears throat> no, she was drinking in a very elixir of life through that open window. She is celebrating her freedom. Her fancy was running riot along those days ahead of her. Spring days and summer days and all sorts of days that would be her own. She breathed a quick prayer that life might be long. It was only yesterday that she thought with a shudder 
that life might be long. Those two sentences right there might be worth underlining, highlighting. She, she says a quick prayer. God, let me have a, a really long life going forward. When only yesterday, the thought of a long life in this marriage with this person uh, just made her shudder. Now she can't wait to experience it. She arose at length and opened the door to her sister's importunities. There was a feverish triumph in her eyes, and she carried herself unwittingly like a goddess of victory. She clasped her sister's waist, and together they descended the stairs. Richard stood waiting for them at the bottom. But finally, she leaves the room, and she's coming down the stairs, and then this shocking event happens. Someone was opening the front door with a latch key. It was Brentley Mallard who entered, a little travel stain, composedly carrying his grip sack and umbrella. He had been far from the scene of the accident and did not even know there had been one. He stood amazed at Josephine's piercing cry at Richard's quick motion to screen him from the view of his wife. When the doctors came, they said she had died of heart disease, of the joy that kills. When she's coming down the stairs, her husband is coming into the room. He was not on the train. He was far from the train when it happened. And when she sees him, she lets out a piercing cry, has a heart attack, and just dies right there. And everyone assumes that it's a heart attack uh, because of just the joy she felt that he was still alive. But we know different. We know that she has a heart attack and dies because she's uh, just shocked that he is still alive and all the freedom that she thought she was going to experience for the rest of her days uh, is now gone. That is the story of an hour, which takes a look at you know, marriage, especially marriage over a long period of time. I hope that this uh, little short story, this reading, my reading of the short story has been helpful to you in preparation for taking a test. That's one of the two Kate Chopin stories that will be on your little Kate Chopin short story test. Thanks very much for reading and for listening. I hope it's been useful. Okay, bye.